The FBI is one organisation you probably don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of. While the FBI has been criticised for some questionable decision making throughout their history, they have enough manpower and resources to solve basically any problem one way or the other. Sophisticated is probably an understatement when it comes to describing their training and tool sets, and their basically limitless supply of time and money means they can just brute force problem solving when sophistication fails. You know the idea that a room full of monkeys with typewriters and an infinite amount of time will eventually reproduce the complete works of Shakespeare? Well, the FBI is a little like that. So what happens when you pit the FBI against a virtually undefeatable bomb? A bomb the FBI described as the most complex and one of the largest they had ever seen. A bomb so complicated that even today it is unrivaled. Can they defuse it? Well, let's first take a look at the man who built it and why he did, because believe it or not, this story would still be an insane drama-filled ride even without the crazy bomb. Janos Burgess was born in Hungary in 1922. In 1941, Hungary entered World War II on the German side, before Germany later occupied Hungary to stop them suing for peace with the Allies. Burgess enrolled in the Air Force and fought for the Germans as a pilot. He was captured and sentenced to 25 years of hard labour in a Siberian gulag. After almost eight years, he was released as the Soviet Union was repatriating prisoners of war to their home countries. He didn't remain in Hungary for for very long, however, and he and his wife fled to the US as the Soviet Union was suppressing revolution in the country. He arrived penniless, but spent the next few years working various construction jobs, until in 1964, he started his own landscaping company in California. By now, Janos Burgess was no stranger to hard work, having had to endure very difficult conditions to make it this far. But he was also pretty clever too, which, in tandem with his experience working with his hands, led him to becoming a tinkerer, and he often spent whatever spare time his business afforded him fiddling with things, welding, soldering, and wiring various inventions. His work ethic paid off, and by 1972, Burgess had multiple businesses, dozens of employees, and millions of dollars. Things weren't all rosy for Burgess, though. A hard life had turned him into a hard man, and he beat his two sons and made them perform grueling work for his business, leading to a strained relationship with them. Frequent fights with his wife led to a divorce in 1973, though she stayed in a trailer on Burgess' land so she could still watch over the kids. In 1975, she disappeared. Three days later, her body was found with a lethal combo of alcohol and Valium in her bloodstream. The death was ruled a suicide, although it was somewhat suspicious. Her keys were found in her car's ignition and her body was found in a field behind the family home. What wasn't found? The bottle she had drank from. After her death, Janos Burgess began spending money like never before. Well, if you can't enjoy life after the mysterious death of your ex-wife, when can you? He sold off his landscaping business with hopes of retiring, bought three Mercs and then lost his license for speeding, then bought a plane instead. He had been a pilot after all. He often flew this plane up to Lake Tahoe, Nevada, where he would gamble at the casinos nearby. A particular favourite was Harvey's Wagon Wheel Resort and Casino. It turned out Burgess was quite fond of gambling, and soon he was gambling quite a lot of money. So much so that he was regarded as a high roller at Harvey's Wagon Wheel, and they would often set him up in the best suites for free. He was even invited to Harvey's Ranch. While there, they gave him a shot at flying Harvey's helicopter. But gambling is a mugs game, kids. It's the one vice I don't partake in for two simple reasons. I have a basic understanding of probability and statistics, and another basic understanding that any business that regularly loses a lot of money cannot possibly be as widely successful as casinos are. Look at Las Vegas and tell me these places are losing money hand over fist. You're going to learn a lot of cool stuff in this video, but if you didn't already know it, this is the most important. Never gamble. Not having a genius advisor like me in his life, John Burgess began losing a lot of his money gambling. A lot, lot. His checks began bouncing and debts began to pile up. A restaurant he owned mysteriously burnt down, in the same way his wife mysteriously went missing, and Burgess collected 300 grand in insurance money. He lost it all at blackjack. As his finances were failing, so too was his health. After suffering stomach problems for years, Burgess was diagnosed with abdominal cancer in 1979. He continued gambling, although he was well past broke, and no longer enjoyed the special treatment he had once received from the casino. His life was in tatters. 
but Janos Burgess saw a way out. In 1980, he made contact with his now adult sons, Jimmy and Johnny. Okay, look, I know it's been an unusually eventful story so far, and now his kids are called Jimmy and fucking Johnny, but I swear I'm not making this up. Burgess told his sons of a crazy plan, and although it was absolutely insane, and the boys had a complicated relationship with their father, they still respected, and maybe even feared him a little bit, enough to be roped into it. They knew their father was at rock bottom, and they wanted to help him out, thinking the plan was too far-fetched to follow through on. Late one night, the three of them made their way into the mountains to a hydroelectric construction project in Johnny's van. They snuck in and made off with 1,000 pounds of dynamite and blast caps that were to be used in excavation. Burgess knew they would be there thanks to his experience in landscaping. He had used dynamite in the past and knew there would have to be some on site for this hydroelectric project. After covering their tracks, the three made a clean getaway. They went their separate ways after the dynamite was stored at Janos Burgess's house. Over the next couple of months, Burgess began constructing a bomb with the dynamite. In late August, he borrowed Johnny's van and made a call to Bill Brown. Brown had worked for Burgess when he still ran the landscaping business. Burgess offered Brown and his son-in-law, Terry Hall, a couple of grand for a day's work, or rather, a night's work. All they had to do was help him deliver a machine to Harvey's wagon wheel. They happily accepted. They drove the van to Lake Tahoe and unloaded a heavy machine covered with a white sheet that said IBM on the side. They were wearing blue overalls. They wheeled the machine into Harvey's at around 5am where none of the staff paid any attention to them. They brought it into the elevator and up to the second floor where they left it in a small waiting room outside the casino's telephone exchange. They removed the sheet and left. On the way back home, Burgess informed the two that they had just delivered a bomb. Shortly after, a nighttime worker stumbled across the machine. Knowing this device should not be here, he called security and then police. There was an envelope on the ground next to it. Inside, the contents explained the large machine was a very complex bomb that would be detonated if a demand for $3 million in cash was not met. Soon the hotel and surrounding area was evacuated and cordoned off, then flooded with FBI men and explosive specialists. From both the ransom letter and varied analysis, including the use of x-rays, they learned this was no ordinary bomb. Some of the claims about the bomb in the letter were bogus, but analysis revealed many to be true, leaving agents baffled as to how to approach it. The device consisted of two steel boxes. The larger of the two contained nearly a thousand pounds of TNT. The smaller box welded on top of the other contained the circuitry and triggers for the bomb. On the side of this box there were 28 switches. The letter explained it was impossible to disarm the bomb even by the creator. It had numerous electromechanical fusing mechanisms that when triggered would complete a circuit between a battery and the detonators exploding the bomb if it was tampered with. Of course, there was the timer, which would detonate the bomb after a certain amount of time had passed. You couldn't separate the two boxes because the seam between them was fitted with a layer of foil, which would complete a circuit if a metal object was inserted to try and pry them apart, detonating the bomb. You couldn't remove the lid of either box, as they were connected to pressure switches, which would also detonate the bomb. You couldn't undo any of the screws because they were fitted to spring-loaded contacts. You couldn't drill through the boxes because they were also insulated with foil that would complete a circuit if a drill bit touched them. You couldn't flood the device with water or foam because inside there was a float from a toilet cistern that would complete a circuit if risen. There was also a pipe inside lined with more foil. Inside the pipe hung a metal pendulum that would complete a circuit if it made contact with the foil, meaning the device would blow up if it was moved any more than the tiniest amount. The letter explained that even though it was impossible to disarm the bomb, a special combination of the switches on the outside would deactivate the pendulum, making it safe to move so it could be detonated at a remote location. The combination would be given once the $3 million was received. Oh yeah, and some of the switches were rigged to the detonator, so you'd better not fuck with them if you don't know the combination. Not only was it the biggest improvised bomb the FBI had ever seen, it was also the most complex. The FBI concluded they had no way of knowing if the pendulum was armed or disarmed, so even if they had the combination, they couldn't know for sure it was safe. Because of this, they decided it wasn't going to be moved under any circumstances. Either they were going to have to figure out a way to disarm it, or it was going to be detonated in Harvey's. 
Armed with this knowledge, Harvey decided he would not be paying the ransom. John Osburgis and his two sons were waiting high in the mountains above Lake Tahoe that night. The ransom letter had come with a complicated set of instructions for the money drop-off. A lone helicopter pilot was to fly up with the money to a point in the mountains. There, he would find directions for the next point, and so on, until he met with the extortionists. There, Burgess planned to take the money and helicopter at gunpoint, and make off with both. The FBI sent out the helicopter, but instead of money, the pilot held onto a bag full of newspapers, which had been calculated to match the weight and volume of $3 million in $100 bills. He was also not alone. Inside the helicopter hid an armed and armoured FBI man. High above this helicopter was another, a Huey carrying a six-man SWAT team. Hilariously though, the instructions proved too complicated and the pilots flew for an hour after reaching the first point trying to find the next one before giving up and heading back home. Burgess had to head home empty handed. He was probably very disappointed, although ironically it was almost certainly best for him that the FBI didn't manage to find him. The following day, the FBI had become very nervous about the bomb. They had missed the ransom deadline and the extortionists were still at large. The bomb could explode at any moment. They couldn't be around it much longer. If they were going to do anything, they had to do it now. They decided to make an effort to disarm the bomb. But how? Ideas were shared, but every one of them had been accounted for. The bomb had a defense for everything. Eventually, someone suggested using a specially shaped charge that would direct an explosive jet stream through the box, severing the wires from the TNT. The shock of the charge would obviously trigger the bomb, but if the circuitry was low voltage, the wire could be cut before the electrical impulses could pass through. It was risky. But it was all they had. They took a vote and unanimously agreed upon it. The charge was set up and everyone left the casino as they prepared to detonate the charge remotely. The agents held their breath. They were joined by many spectators. The bomb had been big news and apparently there were bets over when it would explode. But now it was a question of if. Had the FBI figured out how to defeat the most complex bomb they'd ever seen? Were hours of the assembling of their finest minds enough to- <laughs> The explosion tore a five-story hole through Harvey's wagon wheel. The FBI sighed. The spectators cheered. Well, they'd just seen a casino blow up. That's fucking awesome. Maybe a few of them want some money out of it too. John Osburgis saw the explosion on TV. Oh crap. Undeterred, he amazingly decided his next plan of action would be another bomb. He told Bill Brown and Terry Hall, but the two men wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't even realise they were involved in the first bombing until it was too late. Burgess was not having it though, and told them he'd have them killed if they betrayed him. Brown knew about Burgess' wife, so he believed them. For the next year, the FBI tried to track down the bombers. They managed to identify Johnny's van as the one used in the crime, but had no other evidence. Harvey offered a $500,000 reward for information. In the meantime, he reopened parts of the casino that were still operational and even built walls with windows that allowed gamblers to peer at the FBI agents combing through the bombsite. Information about the bombers would come from a bizarre source. Shortly before the bombing, Johnny had dated a girl who had overheard the plan. They later broke up and she told her next boyfriend about it after the bomb went off. This man called the authorities to let them know. The dirty rat. Johnny and Jimmy were arrested in 1981 and both gave up their father for immunity. Janos Burgess was convicted in 1982 and sentenced to life in prison. Bill Brown and Terry Hall didn't talk and they were each sentenced to seven years. In 1996, Janos Burgess died in prison of liver cancer at the age of 74. To this day, his bomb remains the most complex the FBI has ever examined and is supposedly still used in training to this day. Well, it was a pretty crazy story. Hell, even if it was just a regular old bomb, it's still wild. The details of the bomb itself, though, 
Magnificent. I love this kind of stuff. If you do too, I have another video about a crazy couple who made a bomb that would explode if they were incapacitated and then took a bunch of kids hostage with it. You'll remember earlier in the video I told you to never gamble and brother let me tell you watching a Cukeser video is never a gamble. So why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thanks. You're a star. This device was a pretty sophisticated, quite complicated piece of machinery, unlike anything we'd ever seen before or anybody in the bomb disposal business had ever seen before. What we know about it afterwards is that it virtually was undefeatable.